Hi guys. This week we are reading Kushal's Dart. With me is my lovely co-host. Maria. I should ask, obviously, because we live in such a sensitive Me Too environment. Gina, what would be the superlative you would prefer? Badass co-host. <laughs> I like ruggedly manly because it describes me so well. Yeah, he goes he goes for rug, ruggedly manly as his. I mean, you gotta go with Mistress Something. Let's see. Okay, so with us is our other, is a guest host. It is Mistress Blue Hair, Gina. <laughs> I think you can cut out the blue hair. I'm pretty good with Sapphire hair. She oh, okay. Mistress She of the Sapphire hair. You know, I mean, it's not bad. Anyway, we are joined with a co-host today because today we are discussing, as I said, Kushal's Dart by Jacqueline Carey. This is actually a book that Gina really loved and she had Maria read. And then they were going to do an overview of the series in a video. And they did that, but the audio didn't record very well. But listening to them as I was editing the video, I like I got really interested in it. So I decided, hey, I'm going to read the book first book at least. And I'm very glad I did because I really liked it. I thought it was really good. Readers, I need to give you, or listeners and watchers, I need to give you some context a little bit. When I first read this book, I, I mentioned to Will that I was reading it and he goes, oh, is that that purple smutty book for ladies? And I was like, I mean, maybe, because at the time I just read the opening and eh, her opening's a little purple. I love Jacqueline Carey's writing and we're going to talk about why she's a great writer, but her opening is a little like, if, if you have a sensitivity to purple this writing. This book starts on the worst possible foot imaginable and <laughs> It's kind of weird how much better the book gets as it goes along. But Will was like, oh, the, the smutty, if for women, the, the lady romance book. And uh, I'm happy to say he has seen the error of his ways and he knows okay. he was wrong. <laughs> Look at the cover of the book and tell me what kind of a book you think it is. All right. It's very. Oh, I saw oh, no. that one too. That's a really that nice one. That one's better. way better. That's way. Because that, that uh, again. That looks that like, lo come on. Most of this book, it's not like them in the Albin wilderness or them in the Scaldi wilderness. Like a lot of this book is more of an action adventure, but that cover does not say action, action adventure. adventure. That book says, I want you to lady, know, lady smut book. My copy has glitter on it from when Gina and I made these <laughs> posters. They made it some very scientific plot very. outlines to discuss mm -hmm. the precise moments in this book that we'll yes. get into yep. but chapter number let's everything. start let's start with gina what originally drew you to this book because you were you know the one who started the this. first the originator okay well you actually have to give that credit to katie because she got me the third book she didn't know it was the third book but she got me the third book from some secondhand bookstore back when we were in college to be fair it doesn't say it's the third book. <laughs> no it doesn't but also she knows me, so it's right up my alley. She's like, oh, this looks like it's pain and torture and death. Like, here, you, here's a gift for you. I'm like, oh, thank you. Then I started reading, like, I read the first chapter. I'm like, this sounds like it's a sequel of some kind. So I had to go back and read it, and I just love it so much. And then the infection spread to Maria. Maria, tell us how you found this book and what you thought of it originally. Um, So when I first started reading this book, mm -hmm. I started with a hardcover copy that Katie had um and I couldn't get through like the first 10 pages it really I just I was I was struggle busting real hard um and then I was like because Gina was like no you you have to she was like Maria you gotta trust me I mm -hmm. love you you know me trust me you're gonna enjoy this book just fucking read it bitch <laughs> and I was like okay I'm gonna do what I normally do when I hit a point with books where I physically can't make myself read it and I'm going to audiobook it because it's real easy to get through shit when you're like audiobooking. And as Gina and I said in our first video that remains forever unseen by the <laughs> eyes of the world, I did not enjoy the first third that much. I got into the swing of it. The prose very quickly becomes less purple and just like picks up this like um, narrative cadence that is really interesting. And the world is very like fleshed out. There's a lot of political goings on. And I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard me say before, like when I read Dune, that all I wanted was Dune to be Game of Thrones in space for the politicking. And this book has a lot of great politicking. And so like that kept me through the first third. And then mm, that second third started and it was just Mwah. and and it just it's fantastic the this book is great the series is great i am so glad that that video that got scrapped did enough of a good job showing the pros of this book Take that it, it made will, will. Yeah. <laughs> want to read it 
So Nova then the totally vector against it. He was, was totally you against it. Then... Okay. All right. All right. Wait. 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 Guys. 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 He referred to this book as Crucial's vagina. Yeah, he did. First of all, you're not supposed to tell people stuff that I say that's cancelable because that's a lot of stuff. Okay, so here's what happened. When Maria originally read this, in solidarity, I read the first chapter with her. Which again? The first chapter, I maintain, is really purple. And it is probably the most purple part of this entire book. Now, part of it is I listen to this in audio. Pros bother me less in audiobook form than they do in, in text form. So I'm just going to put that out there. I really love the pros of this book, but they may be a little purple if you're reading them. But nobody has my exact exacting standard, so I don't think it's really an issue. If you're thinking about whether to read or not. Oh, yeah. Okay, shut up, Maria. Don't do more weird voices of me. I'm a pro. I'm I'm, I'm the smartest man in the room. She's just exposing how she normally talks. She puts on an <laughs> affect for this. But that's how she normally talks. It's very odd that she has a job. We're going to discuss this book because this is a super long book. It's 30 hours on Audible, and I listened to it on double speed, and I still found it too long. We're probably going to go less into the plot Wait, than normal. Wait, did you enjoy the book? You didn't get to that part. I enjoyed the first third more than Maria did. I was engaged. I was like, okay, I like this. I like the prose. I was shocked. In general, I have a much higher tolerance for kind of montage descriptions of like, oh, this is this stuff is happening in life and this stuff is happening in and life. And then we I skipped like the to world. the next stuff. And then what happened is that the second part happened. And that's how we're going to discuss this book. We're going to discuss it in thirds. We're probably not going to go as in depth as we do with some of ours because it is such a long so book. Much. But, and then the second half started and I was like, Oh, I'm so here for this shit. I love it. I like, I'm really here. I love this. The first third was so boring compared to this. And then the third- And he liked it more than I did. We'll talk about it because it's interesting because- um, I enjoyed we'll, it better we'll the second we'll time there. around. I enjoyed it much more the second time I, around. Part of it is I don't remember any of the politicking, any of the names. I found I forget names constantly, even worse on audiobook form than text form. So like, there's a lot of politicking and I'm just like, I don't- I And, really and like if that. you've watched any of our videos, you know this to be true. And then in the last third, I found I did not love as much. Um, I think the way I described it to Maria is there's too much, there's too little character development and thematic jelly to spread over the plot bread. And I think that's kind of my overall view of it. Um, but like, it's irritating how much I'm going to have to read the rest of her bibliography because she writes really well. The things she writes about, I'm interested in. So overall, really liked it. Um, but things yeah, that... I mean, there are things to discuss still. The first third of the book was the best part, in my opinion. I know you guys disagree. But considering why I love it, it makes sense. She is the Fedra to our Delanis, but okay, go ahead. <laughs> so what we are going to discuss the book now. Now, uh, Gina and I made a lot of these lovely diagrams. And the reason I want to bring it up is because um, the books, all the books in this series have the same basic premise, which is there's an investigative period. Generally, it happens in Terdange or Terdange and somewhere else. Um, which is the country that the main character is from. Then there's like a travel period, uh, or no, there's the investigative period. And then there is, oh no, the main character is enslaved <laughs> or is in prison. <laughs> and that kicks off the actual like plot of all the books, <laughs> like like where things really pick up. And then uh, there's that, that arc of her like dealing with that, getting out of that and doing, and there's a lot of travel in that. Another period uh, and then there's one climax, and then there's another thing, and then the last climax. And this book, too, follows that. But before we get into too much detail, I just want to talk about the world for a second to just couch you in. Maria's definition of a second is significantly longer than you guys would think. But go ahead, Maria. <laughs> Listen, I don't see you doing it. I mean, do you want to do it? It would be probably quicker <laughs> if you did it. Let's con compare and contrast how I do it, because this is how I do it. Okay. So in this world, there was an angel called Eloa who supposedly fell from grace, but like was kind of cool with it because he was the son of the one God and Mother Earth. And he was like, I'm not going to go to heaven. I like it here. There's a lot of sex. So he went to France and in France, he was like, all right, this place is pretty beautiful. There's lots of wine. It's awesome. Me and my 11 or 12 angel companions are going to sit around here. And my commandment is love as thou wilt. And then once he like died or went away or whatever, each 
of the angels have like a specific region and house and each of the houses is like super sex positive and like they have different things that they're cool with no 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 that that has nothing to do with the different um really i thought angels. it did yeah no, no, no. No. There, the, it's the regions so there's the regions which are so like kusheth is of the kusheline houses who the angel kushil uh and then there's like a bunch of the others and and so it's they correspond to the different regions the different houses are named after flowers and it's just different tastes they're sexy houses and and the houses are only like he's talking about them like they're the houses of like nobility no, no. so let me let me step in will is obviously not handling this oh i'm, I'm, oh, I'm oh, maria I got you. 30 hours later. Will's right. There's a Angel Eloa. He has his companions. They settle down in this land. It's alternate history France, which they call Terdange. Eloa's companions have a lot of sex, as did Eloa. And so everyone in Terdange is really, really beautiful because they have the blood of angels and nowhere else on the planet is as beautiful as they are, <laughs> which I, I don't love, but whatever. It's part of the I told Maria thing. it would be so much funnier if the Terdange thought they were the hottest, but then everyone else was like, wow, you look kind of weird. Hot. You look kind of weird. I thought that would have been great. Or like they were so hot, nobody wanted to touch them. But anyway, <laughs> eventually the companions die. Eloa's gone. They, they all go off to the tear donge in the sky and life just continues there's the different like royal houses and like aristocratic houses there's a king and then in uh there's something called the night court and the night court is a bunch of courtesan houses it's like there's prostitution and then there is the night court which is elevated fancy prostitution um and you're like if if you are a courtesan of the night court it's People are like only royalty can afford or aristocrats or rich people can afford to sleep with you. And there are the 13 houses, which are for the different tastes. If you're a man who likes things a little rough, you like to you like to smack things. We've got Valerian House for you. If you like people who are really bendy and can play uh, instruments, <laughs> we got Eglantine House. That's my favorite. Yeah, I know. It's so I love Eglantine House. They're just tumblers. That's even whatever. They're entertainers that also will have sex with you at the end of it. Like, did you ever yeah. want a musical I performance mean, with acrobatics and then you or did you ever just... fetishize? Or did you ever fetishize a con uh, contortionist? I mean, you just you can slide right on in there. Uh, and then there's like Serious House, which is the oldest and first among the houses which their thing is ephemeral fading beauty you have to look delicate and when people touch you you shake a little <laughs> oh, but they're also supposed to, like the ones who Pedro always said like the ones who survive are the ones that have like steel in their spine so, yes like, yeah yes, so they like they ephemeral, they look delicate whatever. and so there's 13 of them i don't remember them all I don't know who who does. Probably Carrie. And so the reason we mention this is because this world is incredibly sex positive. One of our commenters said, like, had recommended this book. He was like, the Kushiel series, which answers the question of what if world building was sexy or no, horny? What if world building was horny? And I will argue, I don't agree with that. This book is surprisingly non horn not horny. We'll get to it. We'll get to that. I will no, I will just say very quickly that the way I described it to Maria is it's kinda like if a horny person wrote down the background and the, the world and then a non horny person wrote, <laughs> wrote it and just took it totally straight and like literary and you're like, This is there there's a weird disconnect between we have a main character who has special sex powers and I'm not gonna describe any of the sex they're into. Like it's an odd thing towards later, but uh we'll get there. He's talking about how later in like the two thirds, second two thirds, there's no descriptions of the sex. Oh, um, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so it is like a very, and so what I said is it's more like if uh, world building answered the, like what if world building was sex positive? Because that's really what it feels like. And the reason all of that is important to go into is because Phaedra, our main character, our little bub is the sex worker. Um, and not only is she a sex worker, she is a cho one of the chosen for one of Eloa's companions, the, the god of punishment and, and contrition, Kushiel. And she's she's got a little a little uh, red dart, a little red moat in her eye, her left eye. That's Hold on, I got, I got it actually right here. Kushiel, he was one of the punishers of God chosen to deliver torments to the souls of sinners that they might repent at the end of days. Yes. So that guy has chosen Fedra to, to take get all the pleasure. Pain of the world. Yes. To take all the pain of the world. And, and this is going to come up way more in later books, but specifically uh, suffering makes her horny. 
she finds pleasure in suffering, uh, which is going to come up in a couple scenes later in the book that are just real sad. And like, you feel for, for her. That's our main character. She comes from this world. So she's very like from a young age, she knows about sex. She knows the stuff in it. She was sold into this by her parents because her, her dad was really dumb with money didn't make good decisions her mother was also a courtesan of the night ho- night court but from jasmine house which was for more exotic beauties which also correlates to darker skin which is if i believe if i was put into one of the houses it would have been jasmine house so th- this is my homage to that in in a tasteful youtube appropriate way her parents got married they couldn't afford to keep her and they needed money for another venture so they sold her and they sold her into serious house and what that means is it's basically indentured servitude but with like sex (laughs) where she has a mark which is how much they bought her for and once she has paid that back she gets to do whatever she wants and it's really problematic a little bit (laughs) like if you if you think too hard and you don't squint at it you're like oh, wow, little kids are getting sold to be prostitutes. (laughs) Now, there is a thing about, like, they do have to choose whether they serve Nama, which is their their god, the goddess of, like, Nama saved Eloa by sleeping with people to get him out of bad situations and through places. And so she is considered a holy figure. She used her her body, her, her, her feminine wiles, to help him. And each house has a different interpretation of what her feelings were like some of the houses it's because she just really liked the sex and some of them it was because it was an act of love and some of them it was because she was punishing the other people with pleasure um and uh which is how all the different houses appeared you have to choose whether you're going to follow nama and so it's not explained in this book which when i first read it was a little problematic but later you find out that if you don't want to serve nama but you have to pay off your mark you can do other things like make clothing or like just work for them. Like you you don't have to, because I was reading some people uh, who did a read along for this book and they were like, oh, little children being sold into sex slavery, that's very problematic. But no, you only- you It's only... worth pointing out too, that it's not just indentured servitude. There's also a certain, there's a religious aspect, aspect to it of yes. serving Nama. So Carrie really, I think tried her best to make this, like to elevate the idea of prostitution and make it something like where it could have been really problematic. But I do think she put the work in to make it less so. But yeah, so now we're gonna talk about the first third of the book. So I'm just gonna give you guys a brief summary. Sexy times in Terre d'Ange and sexy spying. Phaedra gets bought from Sirius House by a man named Delaney, who is like aristocrat, spy master. Outcast. And he has uh, another um, protege named Alquin, and he's training Phaedra and Alquin to be sexy sex prostitutes, spies. sex spies, to, because there are plots are happening, and he wants to find out what it is. And one thing I will say for this section of the book and you guys can uh, talk about this as well. She does an incredible job laying, and like, I think a lot of this went past Will's head because of his inability to remember names. She does an incredible job laying out all the politicking that is going to have ramifications through the entire book and some stuff into the second book in this first third that is really wild. She does it in a way where Phaedra doesn't really know it's happening while she's seeing it or like, because like, Phaedra is in this first third, and this is another reason I don't like it. There's a, a term called a brat. Phaedra's a brat. <laughs> when somebody's describe like, what a brat is. <laughs> so in, in BDSM, there is a, there are brats, which are subs, but where they're like, you have to make them listen. They want you to make them listen. But they're going to be like, no. <laughs> and then you have to like, I don't know, do whatever you do to make them listen. <laughs> But Phaedra's a brat. Like, people will be like, this is how you do things. And she'll be like, no, why? Or she'll be like, I'm smarter than you. <laughs> and I'm, I'm obviously mocking right now. I love Phaedra. She becomes such a great character. But she starts out as such a little shit, guys. <laughs> She's such a fun... She argues with everyone. Like, it, she is enamored with Delani from day one. But God forbid she let him know that. You know? <laughs> like... <laughs> She's like, I know about things. And he was, because like, there's this part where, it's, so what Delani's going to teach her is how to see, take in information and draw conclusions about it. It reminded me, weirdly enough, a little bit of like in Dune with the- um, Benny Gesserit. The Benny Gesserit. And not just the Benny Gesserit, the other, the the, the computer guys. The Mentats. The Mentats. Um, where like, you're just supposed to take in a massive amount of information and like put conclusions together. 
And at one point, Fedra's like, I noticed things. And he's like, tell me about the coach you came in on. Uh, and she's able to describe, like, all, like, it was red. It had silk cushions, blah, 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 blah. And then he's like, Alquin, who's his other protege. Alquin, what did you see? And he's like, it was an unmarked person, this person, blah, blah, blah. And he puts together a whole, like, like how you could find out where the coachman was from and all this stuff and information about who hired the coach. And Delaney's like, see, Fedra, that's what I want to teach you. And she's like, fine, I guess. <laughs> like, she's just such a shit. It's great. She has a lot of growth. Part of the reason for that, especially when she was so young, is, like, if you think back to Harry Potter, like, Harry Potter, Dumbledore deliberately kept him away from wizarding society when he was growing up, for the most part. Ever since Delaney bought her mark when she was, like, what, 10 or something no mm-hmm. not even 10 10 no it's when she's 10 it's her 10th birthday when she was bought when the bark was bought oh to her. i think she was seven yeah it was something like that so like every yeah, he was, was at seven, seven he's like oh this girl's gonna want some whippy stuff when she grows up and she, at, at that seven. point but at that point she was <laughs> protected and treated like special and like you know to some degree from different people so like having basically said that oh you were bought at the highest price that we've ever sold anyone to at seven. And some that same person telling you that you are the special person and you're the one, only one born for the last three generations. Who's an Angi set. Yeah, you kind of feel a little bit important at that point. Yeah, here's the thing. Again, I think this is completely justified. And like, I, so like, Will loves bitchy female characters. It's one of his weaknesses. <laughs> Only if they're hot. <laughs> I don't. Like, they just... But he, I love this. I Phaedra has to start here because a lot of the things... And, and what I was trying... How I got on this tangent was she is looking and all the stuff, like, all the politicking and stuff is happening around her. And she's just, like, not taking it seriously at the time because she gets a little cocky. She gets a little full of herself mm-hmm. as she begins to, like, learn. And, like, Delani like, stuffs knowledge into her, their heads, like... Family lineages, history, language. Uh, there's one scene where Fedra's like, my brain hurt. <laughs> it was a lot. But it's it's fantastic. And I think the important thing here is how she, Carrie lays out all this political stuff in a way where you don't realize at the time that any of this is going to be important later. Except for a couple of scenes where Fedra goes, I wouldn't realize how important this moment was. Yeah until much later and you're like okay i should maybe remember that and then you don't and then it happens and you're like oh shit that scene was important so one thing i do want to just interrupt really quickly to talk about is jacqueline carey's writing style and that this is told from first person and if you guys have watched my children of blood and bone video um i did not love the way first person was used there between multiple viewpoints this time i felt like it was used very very carefully and deliberately and i loved it because what it does is that this is clearly told by an older fedra like it's not i forget what the term is like it's not like she's writing in a journal but the narrator's voice is an older fedra and what it does is it gives a certain amount of distance between the narrator and the character and i really liked that because it makes everything feel more dispassionate and unsentimental and more realistic she gets away with some things in this book that I think she couldn't get away with if she hadn't set up this very realistic distance tone. It's funny because the way I told Maria this, and Maria, do you want to say what conclusion you drew from it about my personality? Yes. Um, so by having, Will doesn't like, if the, if the author shows their hand and really wants you to care about something or wants you to think a character is bad and like the narration is really leading you to think that this person is bad, Will is a contrarian and he goes, fuck you, I like that character or fuck the main <laughs> character, I hate them. So what this narration style did for him, because he's right, especially in the first third, there is like a lot of distance from young Phaedra growing up. Like you don't feel her emotions a lot. And it's because older Phaedra is just looking at this and telling you the story. And what that does is because the author's not showing their hand, it allows Will to actually care about the fucking characters and not want to hate them just because the author wants you to like them. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that's an interesting thing to realize. And I think it's healthy for me to realize this as a, as a person. Yes. But I, yeah, I really like that. It gives a very dispassionate view of the world. And again, I think she gets away with some things later in the book that would not work as well in this first third. And the important things to know about the plot in this first third is that Delani is... Has a has a mysterious background and a mysterious um, history that he's using, and he's trying to get better in with court. And he has a friend called Melisande, and Melisande is like the 
sexiest of like mastermind ladies and Fedra is just drawn to her instinctually and magnetically. Melisande embodies kind of the authority and very much the sort of dominant role in uh, a relationship like that. And so Fedra is immediately drawn to her magnetically and that will become relevant throughout the book. But she is also politicking as much as Delon. Also a important difference there is that Phaedra is drawn to the very thinly veiled cruelty that Mel Melisande emanates. Yes. yes. More so <laughs> than just like, oh, I'm a dominant person who's important in the politics. Like, no, it is very specifically, she is a very cruel person who uses it very carefully and deliberately. And that's what Phaedra's weakness is. Well, what I meant is that she is an embodiment of that kind of dispassionate cruelty. To talk about it a little bit in whole, the book is very much aware of Phaedra's relationship to submissiveness and kink. And so Melisande, to me, I felt like was sort of the embodiment of the dominant part of that role in a more holistic sense than just the bedroom. And so there is like, she is like a fundamental elemental embodiment of that and part of this is and the book talks about this as well as we said fedra is kushil's chosen the the angry whippy whippy god she's his chosen but melisande sharazai is his scion and she is the most kushil and kushaline of all the kushi kushaline scions like it, it they're literally it said like you you get no more kushaline than melisande sharazai she's it and even from like a young age fedra's like oh what is this? <laughs> I am I am shaken. And Melisande is just in the background and her and Delani really get along. Uh, Melisande and Delani do. But there's this thing where like they taught each other stuff. Delani taught Melisande how to like look and observe and Melisande taught him how to manipulate people. Weren't they essentially like lover type relationship? They were, while? except they did not, they could have been, but they did not enjoy having sex with each other. They, they're, he has no interest in the kind of sex she wants to have. There's literally a point where she, Melisande was like, I probably would have married him had, you know, we been able to stand each other in the bedroom. Actually makes it an interesting comparison of Melisande and Delani being really good for each other, but like it not working out because their sex preferences don't match. Then you have Jocelyn and Phaedra, who also have that exact same problem, and it yep. does work out. Really and it well. does work out. Like the, I really like the romance in this book. I do agree with Will. He's going to have a point that the romance, like uh, some of the character like things get dropped in the last third it gets picked back up but you like there's a lot of focus on Fedra and Jocelyn's relationship and then it just goes boom, boom, nothing for a while I really liked how it was in the second third oh, like I, I really so love the intensity of it the way that they're close they're like in a desperate situation and then like he kind of just chills so that she can in the last third so she can bond with another character who a tragic thing happens with so we'll care. Like it really does feel very manipulative in that way. But um, yeah, no, I really love the relationship and I think it, it embodies a lot of the things that the book is interested in in yeah. terms of but it is a themes. really cool juxtaposition. You're right, Gina, Delaney and Melisande who have that same issue of like their mm -hmm. sexual <laughs> practices don't match but Fedra and Jocelyn make it work. You guys don't know who Jocelyn is. And oh, yeah, I'm well, sorry. Okay. Skept you way too hard. <laughs> you'll have to wait and find out. Don't worry, he's coming. Um, so uh, Fedra gets trained in the arts of Nama with Alquin. Luckily, none of their training is practical initially. It's all just like, it's this older courtesan teaching them. Like, she's not a courtesan anymore. She's been out of the game for the while. But Delani's like, come on, Cecily. I know you got it. Like, get back. It, it felt, it literally, the conversation where he convinces her to do it felt like, felt like in a heist movie, they were like, come on, guy. I know you can, st you're the best in One the game. One last job. Yeah. I'm like, That's exactly what it felt like. And it's great because it's literally to train two kids on how to be sex workers. I will say yeah. that, realistically speaking, they would have a much, like if this was a realistic culture, they would have a much younger age of consent. I understand why Jacqueline Carey didn't because you just don't want to deal with that can of worms. But like there are cultures where like you have sex with children. Like that's a, just an accepted part. And I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm just saying like, realistically speaking Within they would probably culture. have it much you can start serving nama at 16 which for me is still a little young so i would say they do to have... me honestly like 20 is 
or 22 is a little young. As you get older, you start to realize how much children are, are still yeah, yeah, yeah. And you are still at 20. So like, yeah, you have that perspective. But at the same time, when you were 16 in high school, how many of your friends were having sex? Yeah, no, I mean, listen. I was having so much, guys. <laughs> he was... Will was homeschooled. I didn't say you. I said your friends. I think it's very not charitable that you think I had friends. <laughs> no, I didn't meet Maria till I was like 23. Here's the thing, guys. I was not having, like, my. I think I knew people who were having sex, but me and my friends were not. We were very much no divergence. But anyway, so they start training for Nama. A bunch of stuff happens. There's a lot of litiking that we're not going to get into, even though some of it is important for later on. And basically, eventually, Alquin gets to start like serving Nama and you do like a, a virgin price where people have to like put money down and they they do an auction for his virgin price. He gets the most anyone has ever had put down for the virgin price. It's very impressive. Alquin does not like serving Nama. He is a delicate, beautiful baby boy. And he's he's not into the service, but Fedra, meanwhile, is waiting in the wings, like, let me out. Let me out them, I'm ready. <laughs> Bringing back to that point, though, Alquin doesn't like serving Nama. He still does, and that's considered blasphemy. Like, you're yes. not supposed to go down this life if you don't actually want actually to. want to do it. But he does it because he's so faithful to Delani and yes. wants to make him happy. I actually thought yeah. that was an interesting contrast with yeah. Phaedra and the whole, and it explores mm -hmm. the whole idea of Nama's service as like a spiritual thing. I think that was like an interesting contrast. I don't super think Alquin is necessary as a character, but there are a few things she gets. Eh, eh, bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> but there are some things she one gets. One of my favorite characters. You can't I just say it's not important. He, he's not. Like, we could have left him out of this summary of the plot. He is a beautiful white haired boy who is just the sweetest thing. And I know what you're going to say, Maria, but he is good for him, in my opinion. No, oh my gosh. No, Will and I are on the same page. We're going to disagree Whoa. on this. That's fine, but. Okay, 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 okay. Really, really quick. I think I think what Will's trying to say, which I do agree with, even though I like Alquin's inclusion in the story, because I don't, this for me is not a, a rule I live and die by. For what Will means when he doesn't impact the story is that if you took Alquin out and you just left it as Delani and you didn't have Alquin, nothing in the story would fundamentally change at all. Like I was thinking about how we're going to outline the plot today. We can leave them out and it doesn't matter. I mean, so my general thesis with the first third is it's too long and a lot of the politicking, politicking just is not important at that point or really for the end of the plot of this book. So I'm kind of thinking of like, okay, if you had to cut things and it's never fun to cut things, it's always painful. Like if you're having to make hard decisions, kill your darlings, as Stephen King said, then Alquin is one of these things that I do think she gets certain character things. So for like example, I think her kind of rivalry but friendship with Alquin is actually kind of valuable and tells you stuff about Fedra and yes. makes her a more likable person. Yes. And again, you explore more about Nama's service, but if you're having to make hard cuts, but to be fair, uh, this is a book that's 30 hours long. She's just not an author who wants, she's an, an expansive writer who just wants to write what she wants to write. And like, I do ex respect that to a certain extent, but that's just my point. I like Alquin. I don't want to cut him out, but just as far as like Phaedra's story and the impact like on the plot of the book as a whole, I get what Will's saying. I don't agree. I, I like that he's included. And for me, it's because of the character work that it gives Delani and uh, Phaedra. I think for the characters, he's very important, and I like his inclusion in that way. And I also, I like Alquin as a character. How boring would it have been to listen to bratty, bitchy, little 10-year-old Phaedra complaining that she doesn't get to have sex yet, and there's, it's just her and Delane, no one else. That would have been super boring. Yes, but I thought it was boring the first time. And I'm like, yeah, I was going to say, that was so you're, not, you're, not, you're not fixing the problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, let's keep going with the plot. Anyway, Alquin starts doing his things. He, he doesn't like the service of Nama. He's doing it for Delani. There's a lot of people who owe Delani things. And Phaedra's in the interesting position position of hers is literally just money. <laughs> Alquin's is like a debt of honor. There's this other character named Guy, and it's also just a debt of honor. Eventually, Phaedra gets her first assignation, and she is just, she's here for it. It's with this guy that specifically Delani wants information from, but she's like, he's like, listen, Phaedra, you're going to have to play the long, long game. Don't push him for anything. It'll come out at some point. Uh, and this is Childrick Dassam, who is my favorite of Fedra's clients. I just, I like him. I like their scenes. He's, I like that he's angry, that he knows, like, 
he knows Delaney's trying to get information and using Phaedra against him. So he literally is angrily like taking it out on Phaedra, but he's into it. And it's great. I love it. And this starts, I think, um, the section that I like to call spying sexy times. And it's where we get to explore through each of the sex scenes, different types of BDSM. And I'm going to turn things over to Gina because a really important thing in this book is how it portrays BDSM compared to all the other books on the market that uh, like we know of, like Fifty Shades of Grey, that Girl. claim to be BDSM. Uh, ever since I started talking to my um, BDSM community friends that we were doing this book review, all of them had have something to say about it. I did not realize, like I knew conceptually like, oh, this is a great BDSM book. It's probably really popular in the community. I did not realize that basically every single person who's not brand new to the community either has read, has had a friend talk to them about it, who read, who read it, or like had some exposure and has opinions about the book. And even more surprising than that is almost all of them have positive opinions about the book. That's pretty like, cool. Basically everything that you encounter in BDSM, because there is a lot, guys. Like there is so much into BDSM. Like there's so many facets, there's so many people, there's so many different relationships. Like it's a it's a whole nother world, trust me. Taking something that is that complex with that many like different everything to do with it, putting it in, into a political intrigue book and making it work really well and make sense is really impressive because you've got, you've got like, okay, so you have Phaedra who is like an ang- anguish. A- Anguiset. Even after listening to it, the podcast again, like I still can't pronounce it right. Um, so she's an Anguiset. And so like that obviously embodies the whole like masochism side. And you got Melissa on who is like sadism side. And it's wonderful. And that's like a self-explanatory thing. I'll explain it more in detail later. But that's a self-explanatory thing. But then you also have, for example, Children of Assam, who is like taking it out on her, but not in a way that's like unhealthy because that's a problem. Like, don't just be, don't, don't go into a BDSM scene when you're just angry at people. It's really bad. Things happen. Don't do it. So he is like taking out his anger on her, but in such a way that they both benefit from it. And, and he's also there for the hunt. Yes. He wants like to, he, he almost is like wanting to earn the right to give her pain almost. It's, it's. It's weird like that. So that's a like positive. I love him. He's great. There's this one woman who Phaedra absolutely, she says in the book, she absolutely loathes these assignations because they are just like the thing that she detests most. And the, that fact alone is why it is so amazing for her to do them because she's used to physical pain. She's not used to mental torture. You got this girl who like takes her out to basically to like a working ranch type thing, gives her impossible tasks, says, if you don't do this, you'll be punished, but not in a way that you think is fun. They're impossible tasks. Like she can't do it. And Frazier gets frustrated and she gets angry and she gets belligerent. And like, that's exactly what her client wants. Like that's the whole game that she plays. That's not traditional BDSM that people typically think of. But it's very much so part of the community. There's different relationship types, and this is one of them. It's not all like, bow before me. Sometimes it's like, I want to watch you do something you can't do and get frustrated about it. Well, the thing about BDSM and kink that I think people often don't understand is it's sort of an umbrella term for a lot of things like the normies don't understand. It's a bit like queerness as a term in that like these things don't necessarily have a lot to do with them. It's almost more of an alliance sense than it is necessarily one yeah. thing. And so there's a there's an umbrella of certain kinds of things within it, but they aren't always tied to the same. And two people within the kink community can just not be into the same stuff as much as they're not into like vanilla sex. Maria, do you want to talk about that one guy? The, oh, I love him so much. Yeah. We should talk about um, him. The fat guy? Yeah, he's my, because I, I remembered this scene and it was even better. I remembered it from the first time I read it, which was years mm-hmm. ago. Like it's stuck in my head. Gina's right. This book shows you like, here's a little a little snippets of all the different flavors of, and, and as Will said, all the different types of relationships un, within the BDSM umbrella. And Fedra goes into this one, um, he's from like the accounting department. Like he's an ex- exchequer of the like coin in. Like this guy, and he's like chubby and short. And Fedra goes in and she's trying all the things, like all the things, and nothing is working. This guy isn't even, he doesn't even have a half chub. And she gets to a point where she's almost crying. And he's like, let me show you how it's done. 
And he, what's it? Hibari? Like where they tie, what is it called when they tie you up? Shibari. Shibari. And he, and it's just incredible because he, he like ties her up like a beautiful little roast. And it's just a great, because it's this other, like, again, when you're thinking of the BDSM, because like you go into this and you're like, how is this going to be? Like kink, and then you're like, oh, okay, this man has very singular tastes, and Fedra's just gonna suffer tied up for a while. I thought also a bit of it was a power play on his part of like, oh, you can't get me hard. Like, absolutely, that's what's up. And you think you're hot shit, but embarrassing her, exactly, embarrassing her. It's great because it's a fun scene. Like, she goes into this thinking it's gonna be like, she's not impressed, and then she comes out of it and she was like, that was an experience. It's great. I love it. Well, and the tour through the um, Valyrian. Seven. Yeah, Valerian House. Valerian House is the the people that get whipped. One big missing piece I felt of the world building Terranch is there's nowhere for pup play. I thought that was weird. I thought there should be a house that was the furry house. <laughs> the one I'm just saying com- it's a big it's a big oversight on Jacqueline Carey's part. The one community missing. <laughs> See, and we don't know. There might have been there might have been a pet shop room. We don't know. <laughs> there might have been. But I'm saying it should have been a whole house. It's a big... I mean, so furry is one piece of it, but then you do have the pet play, which can be very much so normal dumb sub relationship dynamics. It's just there is comfort in being a pet to an owner. So that would... And a lot of and you're always. taking his comment way too. He does. He is, no. I was I was being facetious. I don't like you, Will. Why do you do this to me? No, that's a problem. Is Gina's really bad with like sometimes with sarcasm and and like so Will is going to destroy Gina. There is something very quietly radical about the book concerning it came out in two thousand three. Like we forget, I think that before Fifty Shades of Grey, which is not a good book um, or a good representation of the kink committee, it like it is now a lot more mainstream to talk about and be than it was before that and so in 2003 to just have this like very positive representation of it and actually just exploration of the ideas to an extent uh, is it's quietly radical and and elevated it's an art form it's it, you learned there's a there's an entire like the valerian house like they train their kids they or they test them where like they give you a candy that has spice in it and the ones that can enjoy the pleasure and the pain at the same time they get to stay in valerian house and the other ones you know, go to a house more to your tastes, my little doves. For me, I, I'm not only thrilled with the depiction of BDSM, but the fact that Phaedra is... Because she's, she's, like Gina said, the masochist. And so rarely do you get a protagonist in a fantasy story that is a prostitute. But that is a masochistic prostitute. That is positive, strong. There's this huge thing of uh, just because I yield, I'm not weak. Or just because I submit doesn't mean... Basically, I- something like that which uh, yields is not necessarily weak. Weak, yes. That was the prophecy part. And what I really loved, and this is going a little bit into the second section, is that again, you can tell that Jacqueline Carey actually understands this stuff because there is mixed feelings on Fedra's part later when she is captured by barbarians and like R-worded because we're on YouTube and she is made to be a slave in a literal sense. There is sort of mixed feelings on her part to her enjoyment versus not enjoyment of it. And I felt like that was handled really sensitively in terms of like, okay, parts of her get off on this, but she is not okay with it. And it's a much more base. It's a much more nuanced understanding than like she likes the whippy times or any time she's traded shitty. That's not necessarily what's happening. Mm-hmm. I also like that specifically because there's this stigma that happens sometimes when women are you know hard or sexually assaulted, where like sometimes your body helps things along because like oh something is happening. I can I can do things to make this easier. And women in retrospect can be like oh my god. Did I like, and you question yourself, your self worth, like, and it's terrible listening to survivors react to their body's reaction to these instances and feel betrayed because that's really how Phaedra feels in these moments. Like her body is working against her. So overall, I think it's just really beautiful. We do need to continue though because I, I need to very quickly summarize what happens at the end of this third so we can get to the second third because we have an hour left <laughs> of recording time and then I have to leave. So Phaedra starts her stuff. She gathers some information. She figures some stuff out. Delani's plan is coming together. One of their guards gets killed and he's like, I need to get a new guard. And he gets a Castling brother named Jocelyn Verai, who like the Castling Brotherhood are these like monk 
warrior knights who are t whose job is to protect and serve. The king has two of them at all times. They're the only people in Ter Donge who are like, no, you can't just have sex willy-nilly. Because Cassiel, who was their, like, angel, never forsook the one true god, but he chose to walk with Eloa and protect Eloa anyway. So, like, he damned himself, but he still kept the religious aspects of following the one true god. So the Castling Brotherhood follows all of that stuff. Like, no drinking, no sex at times. Like, you can't have bonds to other people that would make you, like, question your oath to the person you're supposed to be protecting all of that stuff and normally they're like old wrinkled guys and so Fedra hears she's gonna get one and she's like Ugh, I don't want to dried up old stick of a Cosseline brother because again Fedra's just not instead of being like oh yeah Guy was just killed I could you know obviously this is dangerous she's like eat me she turns around <laughs> and there's Jocelyn Varai who is beautiful baby boy as will said he hated how good looking he was uh, why are we uncovering all of my flaws in this like i don't want to be canceled <laughs> well i i mean i don't blame you there is a sense so, when all the characters are so beautiful it's really like so what I, I will say and this is a good time to talk about it is that this book is very much written from the female gaze right i'm i'm just gonna assume you all understand male gaze and i have read a massive amount of stuff from the female gaze because i read fan fiction fan fiction even when it is written by by men is often from a female gaze and the main consumers are women. And if you're writing fan fiction, you know you're speaking to a crowd of women. So I've read a lot of stuff like that, but still it was kind of interesting to me because like this book has so many tropes that I love and I love the writing, but there's always a little bit of a disconnect because it's it's not quite written the way I would write it. So like, or a man would like it written. So like we wouldn't love that Jocelyn is such a pretty boy, for example. Cause he's not ruggedly handsome. Like me. Good point. Good point, Maria. You're, yeah. No, but like, that's the kind of thing is like, it's just a little bit, uh, it's just for a slightly different case. And so I just thought that was interesting as I was reading is that I haven't run into that in a while since I was like 13. I was like, Ugh, girl books. <laughs> girl books. To imitate Maria's imitation of me. Yeah, <laughs> girl books. My imitation of you is still better. Anyway, so Jocelyn and her, they don't like each other. They butt heads because she's like, ooh, I love my job. I'm a servant of Nama and I like pain. And he's like, that's really weird. <laughs> You're what's wrong with society, Fedra. <laughs> and he's like horrified. He's like, you what? Um, and it's hysterical because these two characters, and I want you to know they butt heads so much, it initially didn't even feel like enemies to lovers to me. I thought Fedra was going to have a different romantic interest, but no, congratulations, guys. Here it is. You can't just wrap up the first section and not talk about Hyacinth. Oh, we do need to. Oh, yeah, we do need. So, really quickly, when Fedra was little when she was still living at Sirius House she made a best friend when she ran out of Sirius House one day named Hyacinth he is a Singani which is the Romani uh, analog Singani are like looked down upon there's a lot of like prejudice against them uh, his mother it, like can see the future has a premonition about Fedra and is like the day you find out Delaney's all of Delaney's secrets will be a day you regret forever you should stop looking into this and Fedra's like no I'm gonna keep poking because I'm con contrarian like Will. There's a reason I like Fedra as a yeah. character. <laughs> Um, she remains friends with Hyacinth forever. Like when she first goes to Delani's house, she escapes to go see Hyacinth and Delani's like, if you ever do that again, I will sell you to someone else. And she's like, I don't want that. Cause he's like, I would have let you go. Like, why would you, why would you sneak out? Um, but Hyacinth and her are best friends so much so that when she starts serving Nama and she has her assignations and she has to have a signal, which is her safe word. She picks Hyacinth's name because he is her only true friend that she has no real, like, obligation. Like, she loves Delani, but he owns her mark. He feels safe. Remain really, really good friends the whole time. He makes a name for himself. He he was a poor guy. Like, his mother laundry for people, and then he ends up getting a horse livery and stable and, like, building a community around himself. So, like, Hyacinth is a true up-by-your-brute-strap story. I like him. But anyway, back to getting to the end of this part. I think we got most of the relevant details of the first half. So uh, Jocelyn, Fedra, Butthead. And then one day she has an assignation with Alison Charizai, who does like, who puts her in a like see-through dress with diamonds on it and takes her to a party and parades her around. Uh, Fedra is not into it, but very into it at the same time. And it's the first time, it's first and only time her and Melisande, or I guess no, the first time her and Melisande ever do stuff. And it is everything Fedra wanted and, and, 
anymore. But after this, she has enough money because Melisande gives her enough of a patron gift that she has enough money to finish her mark. So she makes an appointment with the Marquist, Robert Taylor, and she goes to like get her the rest of her. Oh, the marks are the tattoos on their back. How they show that they have finished their service and they have they have completed their servitude thing. They're free. It shows them that they're free to, to end Jelena again. So she's going to get the rest of hers done. And while she's there, a man comes in and is like, people are watching Delaney's house. I have a message from so, uh, someone important. And the message doesn't matter right now. Um, <laughs> but basically, <laughs> Jocelyn's like, oh shit, if there's people at the house, people are probably in danger. So Fedra throws her clothing back on. They run back by the time they get there everyone is dead and actually this was a this was a bit of a gutting scene this was the first time in the book i emotionally had a reaction the first time i read it because like delani is dead with his eyes open and then they hear like a rustling in the library and alquin is like jocelyn had been teaching him how to fight and he he tried his best but there was just too many people and it's just really sad and everyone is dead the entire household elchman was alive and his in his like last dying breaths he told them the secret that they needed to know for the rest of the story there you go you needed alquin jocelyn and fedra are like oh no we have to go to the dauphine and tell her this thing we have just learned that's important but it doesn't act like i don't ever have to tell you the thing and I can tell you the rest of the plot. Don't worry about it, guys. Um, and they're like, and they go and they're like, we need to talk to, to the palace. And they're like, we need to talk to these people. And then all of a sudden Melisande's there and she's like, Fedra, what are you doing here? And Fedra's like, <laughs> Delaney's dead. And Melisande is like, shocketh. And then you find out it was Melisande. Well, she was actually. She was shocked. She didn't, she wasn't expecting Delaney to die. The guy she was working with got over and got over enthusiastic. She is the big bad. Surprise. Yes. I'm sure you guys didn't see it coming at all with our descriptions thus far. <laughs> As a reader, you're also like, wow, I didn't see that. But I don't, like, you're not supposed to be surprised, I think. There's a looming sense of dread with her. Considering that the story is told as someone who is remembering it, and through every time Melisande is mentioned, it's like, I didn't realize the importance of her at the time. Like, I didn't or how realize that she, she meant was. Like, Right. Right. Yeah, anyway. Like, there's no secret. Melisande drugs Jocelyn and Fedra, tries to get some information out of Fedra in really cruel ways. But Fedra luckily holds up and doesn't give it to her to the point so much so that Melisande believes her, even though she does know this information. And then she sells her into slavery that's beginning the second third and again this always happens oh no fedra's a slave again you gotta you gotta get your card yeah so that was we had uh sexy times in Terradon, and now we have slavery in scaldia which is the next section of the book and the scaldians are just barbarians they're basically viking barbarians one thing uh we'll talk about more but one of the things i really like is the portrayal of all the other cultures that jacqueline carey does they all feel like a very vibrant and real people and like that's fun and the scaldi like are the they're the bad guys but like they're they also like have a sense of humor they're funny they're very bombastic she says you know they cry as easily as they fight because they love these big emotions they have beautiful poetry like there's no good scaldi characters but because of and also the distance i was talking about before where everything seems a little more realistic you get the sense that the scaldi aren't a terrible evil pe they're not orcs their antagonism in the story does not spring from some inner badness in them it's like oh this is a political coalition that wants to do a political coalition do. And the basic idea is that the Scaldi were just a bunch of like tribes, not unified, much like this other group of people will eventually get to who got unified once in the past by one like smart guy. And the Scaldic have now got their smart guy, and his name is Valdemar Selig. And uh, he has united the Scaldic tribes, and he has been slowly preparing to invade. Terdange, uh, and he also is working with the Terdange noblemen, who they call Kilbahar, which means silver-haired, but his name is Isidore de Glamour. He becomes a great character in he like three chapters does. towards the end of the book. He goes from being a character you barely know anything about, except that he betrayed one of his best friends and got him like killed and pretended he was like a traitor. I mean, Boudoir was like his family was definitely doing stuff, but it's just like the I, this book does a really good job of all of the characters feel multidimensional. Even when Baltimore said like the like scaldy warlord he's the sophisticated barbarian i've i always love that trope of like the one sophisticated barbarian who's going to unite the clans in a way that like everyone's scared of because they were so disparate and um it's funny because it reminded me of dustborn where we were complaining about how the general there does not have the gravitas 
Valdemir Scali like definitely, he very much feels like he has that gravitas, especially if Phaedra can see his inner workings and his inner thoughts. And like, there's such a great, it, he, he's a fun character. He's really good. And you're like, okay, he is a worthy antagonist. And you can also see the ways in which like he might not have gone down. Like she learns a story about how his original wife died. And perhaps had she not, he wouldn't have been on this quest for glory. And like, cause he wants, he wants Tardange because it's this place of angels and he wants to take over it have all the nice things he wants the palaces all of that stuff and he wants to mix the scaldi bloodline with the teardange bloodlines so they can too be angel touched i like that aspect of his character the like he wants to take on their civility i didn't love how the scaldi as a whole are painted as like envious of the dangelins and how great they are um because again, I feel like the Dungeons have a little bit of a, a main character syndrome where the author likes them a little bit too much. I, I would have liked some Scaldi who are like, let's just hunt some boar. We I love actually, our way. Like, I actually liked how when she first went to Scaldia, they were like, oh, these Dungeoning barbarians. Yeah. Look at these savages. They're so not civilized. So I actually got the sense that for the majority of the Scaldi, the idea of like, just getting more land and like better climate was a good thing but like they didn't most of them didn't care i mean maybe they cared about the idea of like the riches and stuff like that but like i i think that's fair yeah for me on fair. a like like village to village level i didn't feel that want of the civilized uh, society but Voldemar Sally he's educated he's been trying to get his stuff originally she's in a different setting with a different group of people that she's a slave to I'm not going to go into that at all we do need to go into it a little bit in terms of just the characters oh, and, and Jocelyn, what happens to them and, yeah. so what happens is that she is taken prisoner and made like the bed wife slave of the main guy there Gunter and it's very Luxon. interesting right because immediately she's like okay I'm gonna survive this and I'm gonna get through it and again we have an interesting depiction of like her body and part of her are into the submission and the degradation and, and all that. But she as a person is like, I am not into this whole slavery I don't like thing. This. Which again, I think is a really interesting thing to explore because it does take into account the darker side of it while at the same time being like, hey, the character is not defined by this portion of themselves, but we're still going to give it its due, which is something that like in Fifty Shades of Grey, you would just not see. The author would just be like, and then she was totally into it. And and like, and it is, it's a, it's a nuanced under, that's how I type. I'm <laughs> um, and this is really interesting because it's contrasted with Jocelyn who gets captured and like, he won't stop trying to fight people and trying to save her. And he like, is like, no, my honor over surviving. And so like the, the Scaldi stick him in with a bunch of dogs to try to get him <laughs> to chill kennel, out. It's great. That's your pet play. <gasps> You're right. The pup play. Yeah. We did it. We okay. Did it. All right. It is in there. So it's really interesting because he is very oath bound and like, he is serious about his oaths. Like he won't save the nation because he swore to protect Fedra. And Fedra's like, look, how seriously do you take that vow? Because like, you need to pretend to be subservient to them if you want to protect me. Which vow is more important to you? We need to get out of this alive. And the conflict there, I really loved. I loved the way that she, and specifically he slowly starts to have to betray his honor one at a time to make decisions. But it's also great because like he, he has to, the, the vow, he makes what they call uh, Cassio's choice, which is to protect your your like charge overall else. so he breaks like almost all of his vows and like has to change himself at least externally to help Phaedra and it's great Will's right it's so compelling and and it's also I love the scene of him just in the dog kennel and her just yelling at him like get your shit together Kathleen <laughs> he's over here being super dramatic like I'm ready to die rather than do anything <laughs> Ugh. And it's just, it's great. I loved it. It was one of the moments where I was like, yeah, Fedra, like, thank you. That, that was great. We needed this. Um, I think it really makes you bond with both characters yeah, in terms of like, Fedra is so like, you can understand her and you're in her viewpoint, but also you're like, you kind of get her irritatedness with Jocelyn. <laughs> Again, this is my favorite part of the book. I think there's some really good growth it's in it. So Gina, great. did you have anything to say about the characters? Because uh, we're talking a little bit too much. Uh, you guys are talking too much because I don't really like the second part of the book too much. Oh! <laughs> it's good. Oh! It's not my favorite. I don't have a lot to say. For me, I, I would also say that I think it, it is my favorite. I like the part in Karina. So it's really great. And then you get this sense, because originally she's like, we're just going to escape and let them know that like Voldemort Selig is actually an issue and then she finds out 
when they get sold to Selig himself, uh, they're doing like an all thing. They're locked in a room so they can't hear anything. And Jocelyn's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And meanwhile, Phaedra's like, there's a door, there's some barrels. There's like, and you can just see, like I can picture the scene of her just looking at all of these things and him just sitting there in the background like, God damn, this is a pickle. What are we going to do? And then she's like, Jocelyn, move this. I need to get on your shoulders. And he's like, what are you doing? And it takes him a second to realize that she gets up into the rafters and she like, scurries herself and she listens through the the ceiling and she finds out they're planning to invade Terre d'Ange. Isidore Deglamour is helping them and she's like, oh no, we have to get back home ASAP to let people know about this. So they hatch like uh, eventually uh, Valdemar is going to go on a hunting party and they, they plan their escape. And this whole time there are brief little moments and this was the part where I was like, oh, this is the romance, isn't it? Because like there's this moment where like when they're still at Gunter on Larkson's uh, studying where like they raided a village from Terdange and killed a bunch of people and she like had to then sleep with Gunter <laughs> and she was not happy about it. Uh, and she like crawls to Jocelyn who's chained to the hearth <laughs> and like they curl up together and like the, it's not like it's not described as sexual it's not described even as romantic it's just they're, they're two souls trapped in a foreign land seeking out comfort and it's just really beautiful it made my shipper heart go pitter patter yeah it really does it really touches on because like the exile's lament is really a strong point throughout all three parts of the book if you're going to cut something out of the book i would cut that focus out of the book because i think it's unnecessary like i get it sure you miss your home yay but like you know, that was really pulling into like that kind of subplot of the book is there are two people, both from the same land, like whether or not they have a relationship or not, they're both from the same land in this to get foreign area together and they can find comfort in each other because they understand each other. And I'm like, Yay. I, my little shipper heart was also going pitter patter. Pis- no. Yes. Me and, me and Will are out here. Pistolas at dawn, dawn Gina. <laughs> I will fight you on this. I loved it. I don't want, I don't care enough to fight over this. For me, this was just such an elegant. I have a problem where I might like two characters together, but the way they fall in love is not a way that I like super like feel for. And for me, not only is it that they're two strangers in a strange land, but they know each other. But it's also how they begin to appreciate, like he begins to appreciate what she has to do with Selig, with all, because like it is through her situation with Selig that she eventually finds the letter that lets her know, oh no, no, it's not just Isidore de Glamour. Melisande Charizai is also working to like help them because their plan is to make Isidore think that they're working with him and then to like back, like double cross him and kill him and then just take it for themselves. And Melisande is like, yes, Isidore suspects nothing. Your plan is flawless. And what she's trying to do is she wants to be queen as well. I really like that aspect of well of the growth on Jocelyn's part to better understand her and her strengths. Because at one point he's like, you know, when I first came, I just thought you were like a debauched plaything of the rich. And now I know that you're so much more. One thing I would have liked to see a little bit more of, though, would be his under his growing understanding of her uh, kink mindset. And like what I was saying before of him maybe having a more simplistic view of it and growing to understand more of the nuance of it. But I think some of that is being saved for later books. So there's a there's an extent oh, a to which like, okay. For later books. There's a lot of it that's being saved for later books. He grows to respect her. She grows to respect him because she's teaching him how to speak Skaldic. He like, you know, picks it up pretty decently. They're bonding. Um, and then they make their great escape. He has to pretend to be one of uh, Selig's men. They escape. No, 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 no. No, no, no. They don't escape. They escape it. They, es- they escape it. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite things because she descri- describes their initial escape through the wilds. There's a bunch of things that happen on this initial escape that make it worth going through because one thing I do not love is long traveling montages of boringness. There is a book series over here by Jean M. All, Valley of the Horses, uh, Clan of the Cave Bears, Love Clan of the Cave Bears, and Valley of the Horses. But oh my God, Mammoth Hunters had so much unnecessary just traveling and it's it's just so much traveling and it's just like and then they woke up and they walked again and then they ate lunch and then they walked again and then i don't like traveling montages you're telling me that the three chapters of her complaining that it's cold is not unnecessary travel this is literally my favorite part of the book the emotions are so intense they're tired they're exhausted it's a beautiful fight scene in the snow oh where you're God. like oh shit and Jocelyn's not gonna to, be able to do this and then it's she described has to kill beautifully someone. 
Oh God, this is great. And it's great. the reason why I'm saying is this is not actually a traveling montage. There is actual emotional and character beats and, and altercations that happen. The part she skips is when they have to go into the mountains and nothing happens. Cause she literally says they literally have to scale a mountain and come down to get back into Terre d'Ange because the actual path is blocked by Scaldi Raiders. And she's like, I will not bore you with the entire journey, but know that it was cold. And at one point my horse fell off a fucking cliff and that was hard. Um, and then Jocelyn's also broke his foot and then he had to put that horse down, but that's it. That's all you get of it. Mwah, I love it. I like the initial escape from the Scaldi because you get like the Scaldi coming after them. You get the tension. There's anxiety. At any moment, I was sitting there waiting for like the Scaldi to catch up to them. And then they do. And like Will said, it is a beautiful fight scene. The descriptions are fantastic. Jocelyn's like, I'm going to do some stuff. Do not question me and just go with it. And also here's a knife. And if somebody like, and here's a shield. And if someone comes, stab them. She ends up having to stab someone from the original standing, Steading who she kind of liked. And she didn't think was like a bad guy. And she's like, please don't make me do this. It's just a beautiful scene. And Jocelyn is like fighting the good fight out in the Oh, snow. that's the thing we haven't said about Jocelyn is like, the Castiles are super badass. He's oh, taking on like nine people. He's unstoppable, but there's a blizzard. And then she is there. It's, I really love that. That was like the highlight of the book to me. And so then after this, they survive and then sexy time. They get to a cave that Phaedra finds. They go in and it's like they manage to lay down and Jocelyn's injured and she has to like sew him up. And like the scaldy women made fun of Phaedra because she was bad at sewing. So <laughs> like, I'm sorry, Jocelyn. This had to be hard to live through. <laughs> but they're sitting there and like, this is the culmination moment. Like, like they look at each other and like she's touching his face and you're like, oh, is this going to happen? Are they going to do the thing? And they do. And it's beautiful. It's not graphic. But for me, it's my favorite sex scene because there's so much emotion emotion and there's a romantic element that was missing from all the other sex scenes listen i love like as far as like when i read stuff i generally like prefer my sex scenes sans excessive emotion and like touchy-feely like gushiness but this one was just so earned and so like you felt it and it was beautiful and then like afterwards he has to walk away because this was the last vow he hadn't broken <laughs> like he murdered someone he attacked unprovoked like all this other stuff he had done it was also the one that wasn't it broken in the greater goal of protecting her all the others <laughs> he broke with the goal of like okay i'm doing this because i have to protect her that's the more important thing and this is like i didn't need to protect her but i still this is, I still broke this vow. Then the morning after, he's like, we can't talk about that because it shouldn't have happened. And like, he literally walks away immediately afterwards and is like, oh, shit. <laughs> but like, I don't blame him. It is a really big like thing for him. And and he also like, he's still like, he doesn't seem to regret it. He just, it, it's beautiful. I love it. I actually would have liked if he had regretted it more. I felt like uh, one of my criticisms is in the last third of the book, Jocelyn kind of disappears as a character. He just is like- he's a little sidelined. Yeah, I actually would have liked if there's a point where they get back to Terradon after this and i would have liked if like he had just not gone with her on the last third and only showed up at the end because then at least they could have like pined for each other a little bit or you could have in your head been like oh he's doing his own mental things over there whereas with that we see that he's now just like very chill because what happens is that after this point they do get back to teradonj and they go to the queen and or the the heiress uh, the dauphine french word and uh <laughs> they're like look we got scaldy incoming and she's like I don't believe you. And then she's like, oh, I asked my guards, you were here, we believe you. I'm making fun of it. It's all very well done. It's very well done. It's all, like, again, there is such a sense of realness about the book that, like, you understand why people do things. Basically, what happened is that earlier on, there was a match made between this Dauphin princess and the British people who are all Pictes. What? Dauphin? No, 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 I heard Dauphin. The Dauphine. What's funny is I actually used to be able to speak a little French, so I don't know why it's as bad as it is. <laughs> it's very bad. The Dauphine. Dauphine. <laughs> <laughs> Between her, you don't understand. What's the word they say for uh, oral in this? The logissement? The longissement. Yeah, I kept thinking of as longitude. <laughs> So there was a patrol that made between her and the King of the Picts, which is like the British. The Scottish. They were the alternate history of like the Scots. And so everybody around her is like, look, we got a war incoming. You should marry this person or that person who will give you more help. And the, she's like, no, for love, 
I want to marry this other person. Eloa said, love as thou wilt. I feel like this is the correct decision. He could bring people to help us. And then later in the book, there's some stuff about like how the British Isles and like the dungeons are supposed to be like united through love or something. Like that was a little weird to me later on. That's part three. We're not there yet. Oh, we're on part three. We're going to do your thing. Do, do your card thing. Oh, oh, oh yes. that's good point. Fair point. Back to Ted Donge. <laughs> That was great. That was good. You're welcome. <laughs> people should hire me for this. So the queen goes, hey, I'm going to send you, because you're one of the few people I can trust, you, Jocelyn, and Hyacinth off on a quest to go talk to the Albans and get past the Master of the Straits. Two important points. Jocelyn gives up being a Castile. Castile? Castelline. Oh, there's no T. That's why I'm messing I up. I know. I don't Castelline. know where it came from. Because he goes up to the prefect of them and is like, look, she's going to go off to Alba. I want to keep her safe. And he's like, no, you got to think about your vows, dude. And he's like, nah, -uh, I'm going to go with her because I love her. Maria, do you want to do more dramatic readings instead of me? I feel yes, like I'm not. That was... <laughs> anyway, so Jocelyn's more like, no, I, I, she's, I, I promised I would take care of her. I must. You can tell I like Jocelyn. Um, and the priest is like, well, if that's the case, we're going to kick you out, and you're not a priest anymore. Eh. You could have come back, and we could have like made you better. And and he's like, I'm not a Castellan brother anymore. And it's like, and it's it's really touching. And Fedra's like, oh, he lies to them. Yeah, he, he doesn't really... tell them he had sex. <laughs> They're like, what vows did you break, brother? And he was like, I killed a guy. I attacked unprovoked. I drew my sword when I was not intending to kill. Like, all this stuff. And then and then he was like, he looks at Fedra. And then he pauses. Looks at Fedra. About it and says, no, that's it. And I'm like, nice save, Jocelyn. Good job. I'm sure that's the one that wouldn't have, like... But anyway, they go off on, like, uh, a journey, and they have to, like, go find this one dude, and then they have to go to Alba, and Alba's having a civil war, and they have to, like, help in that civil war. One important thing before that, though. Hyacinth comes along with them, and they meet some of his family, the Sangani. I loved how the Sangani were portrayed. Oh. We don't really have time to talk about it, no. but it was like, you very, very much get a sense of their own culture. Now, this is where we have to talk about a weird thing with the books is that there is magic in this world but like there's not a lot of it and people treat it really chilly so this whole time you've been hearing about the master of the straits which is something that stops people crossing from britain to north i thought it was just a dude with an armada yeah and no it's a hermit who lives on an island who can summon a giant face and storms to stop people crossing the two you gotta remember it, the, the fish swim through the, the through the water of his face it's magic it's hardcore magic tonally as a reader you go from magic just being this mystical thing happening and like oh pete some people can see the future mysticism mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden man's face and water <laughs> screaming at you sing me a song it reminded me of in that rick and morty episode where it's like <laughs> yeah yeah with the giant faces but anyway i the reason we have to talk about that guy is because of something that happens with hyacinth but anyway we'll get there the three of them have to like go undercover fedra ends up having to have sex to be able to cross this one patch of land they get to alba they meet drustin mabnectina who is he should be the crew arc which is the leader of the cruinia people the pictish um but his the previous king because they have a weird like kind of not matrilineal but like whoever the like there's the king and then one of the king's sisters like the it, oldest son becomes the next king so it's not the king's son oldest nephew essentially on the female line previous king's son is like no i should be king and so even though drustin is the the one who is supposed to be the crew arc and so they get there they have to basically the Pictish tell them, if you help us put Dr Drustin back on the throne, and also Fedra, there was a prophecy, like there was this thing that where the master of the straits will let people back and forth across the straits if Drustin, the black boar, is on the throne of Alba. More furry content. <laughs> That's more uh, bestiality. Anyway, a lot of once again, there's a lot of difference. No, it does not matter. He's the black boar. Okay. He probably dresses it does up. Not matter. Which... He is. I have to leave in like ten minutes, guys. We gotta get through this, okay? <laughs> Shut up. So they help. They go there. Fedra ends up sleeping with a sister and a brother, not at the same time. They're twins. It's it's fun. It's funny. And she ends up getting like a fan club of soldiers who are called Fedra's boys and sing body songs about her. And I love them so much. But they they fight the war in Alba. They put 
Dresden back on the throne. This is climax one of the book because it feels like a climax. There's a battle, then there's a, there's a climax, there's a denouement. They're like, now we are going to go across the sea. And as they go across, the master of the straits is there and is like, sing me a song. Phaedra sings the song and then he takes them to the island. The song is on the way to there. On the way to, yeah, yeah, yeah. What right. happens is that they're not supposed to fish on the way back and then some idiot fishes. And then he's like, oh, I'm pissed now. And basically the master of the straits has been stuck on this island forever for a while because like, I don't know, an angel made God mad and God trapped his progeny on this island. And now he has to be the master of the straits and he's not allowed to leave, but he controls the waters around Terdanj and Alba and he can see stuff happening on those two nations. And the guy's like, listen, I'm old. It's been a while. One of you motherfuckers is going to replace me. And like Fedra's like, I'm the only one that can solve the riddle. It's going to be me. And then Hyacinth comes and is like, no, it's me. I volunteer as tribute. I volunteer as tribute. And it's so sad because Hyacinth yeah. is just a fun character. And he he reconnected. Something that we haven't mentioned at all was he was completely separated from his Singani family. He finally reconnected. He was going to travel. He was going to be part of the, his grandfather's compania. He was going to take over all this stuff. And then because when Fedra goes to be like, it's me, he's like, no. Fedra, I, I could never see this past, past this point in my life when I looked into the future. This is me. Like, you can't. This is me. And it's just so sad because it's her best friend. And he gets trapped on an island. And she's like, when will I ever see you again? I don't know. I mean, me and Gina know. Will doesn't know. <laughs> but anyway, so super sad. They leave Hyacinth because he sacrificed himself. They go to Terdant and they're like, we have come. We've brought the army. The, the war has already started by the time they get there. Very quickly, it was ruined for me as a military history nerd because the horde of barbarians is 30,000 people. That's tiny. As I was telling Maria, there are like Indian wars where there were more war elephants involved involved in a single battle but we don't have time hit it they come they they bring like the albin forces they team up and then isidore de Glamour has realized by this point that melisan Sharazai threw him under the bus real hard and at the last minute like they were coming up for the final battle with the skull the tensions are high isidore de Glamour decides to turn his army around and join the fight for ter Ter-Dange. oh the final battle scene is so good it's great because what happens is fedra tells him like look you're gonna die either way valdemir selic is gonna betray you or you're gonna be a traitor once we win do you want to go out a hero or not and he goes like fuck it i'm doing it and so he fights vladimir skellig and do, like because he wants to go down and is a dramatic figure a hero and like i just really loved that and the thing is it only works because carrie has set up the world so well and again has that distance so that you can believe that like oh tear dungeons are like they're a little extra and like it makes sense that he would decide like oh, okay i'm gonna go for the song versus trying to eke out a little. It's beautiful. But before that happens, because they have their final, uh, Selig and uh, Isidore Deglamour have an amazing like fight to the death battle. It's great. But before that happens, Fedra gets captured and Selig flays her alive and like skins her back. And while this is happening, Jocelyn comes and is like, no, I'm gonna save her. And like at this point, Jocelyn's getting ready to do the Terminus, which is a, a move that the Castellan Brotherhood trains you on, which is you kill, like, if you cannot get your charge out of a situation alive, and the least cruel option is just to kill them, you it's you and, like, your charge die at the same time. So it's this, like, maneuver where you, like, slit your throat and the charge's throat, and he's getting ready to do that. And then this character, who has been kind of a dick for a lot of the book, charges in on his Arabian fucking horses and saves them. And it is so... Cool. I loved Barky L. Longbear's Aragonian, like, just coming in with, like, oh, it's so, I loved that moment. It's such a cool moment. Anyway, they win the war. Huzzah! Yay! And then they capture Melisan Sharazai, and she gets put on trial, and Fedra goes up. And the entire time, and we haven't mentioned this, once upon a time, Melisan Sharazai gave her a very expensive diamond <laughs> that's pretty massive on a collar. And yes, it is BDSM collar symbolism, by the way. And she's had it the whole time. And she said a couple times, because at one point, Melisande says, we'll see what strikes truer, Kushil's dart or Kushil's scion. And the entire time, like, Fedra's in slavery, she's like, I'm gonna throw this thing at her feet and be like, I answered your question. It's Kushil's dart, motherfucker. But at the same time, she's like, oh, God, she's hot. Yes. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah, no, the entire time, she's also like, she like, she hates her and she wants to be like, ha, it's me, motherfucker. But at the same time, she's like, I also might go down on you. I don't know. We'll see. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did love this book. But anyway, and during the trial, they bring Fedra out and she like, she literally goes up and she drops the, the necklace at Melisande's feet and is like, bah, 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 just because I yield does not mean I am weak. Her testimony is what puts Melisande away. Um, and they're going to execute her the next morning. But surprise, Melisande 
has escaped. <laughs> She's gone. And everybody's like, ah, oh, damn it. Well, everybody, let's just go home. And then Fedra finds out Delaney was actually, had land. It was like- No, no, no. Here's what happens. We get a, for two hours in the audiobook, <laughs> we get Most of Return the of the King endings. I sent, we don't have time to do dramatic readings of them, but I sent them to Maria Highlighted. There's literally six perfect ending lines. And then the book just keeps going. going. The last- Super important part is Melisande ex- escaping. Like that's where the book ended, theoretically speaking. It wraps up some more ends, but but like that's more or less it. She's Delani's heir. She gets the land of Montrev, which was Delani's land, and her and Jocelyn retire there for a peaceful life. Like I'm talking, they are now living off the land. They they've got people that grow like crops for them. Phaedra has a garden. They are now together as a couple. And then all of a sudden, like months into their peaceful existence, Jocelyn's real fucking happy. A package comes, and it's her Sangwa cloak, which is. Sangwa is the color for Angi sets and it's from Melisande being like hi I'm still in the game and she's like god damn it I've got to go back I gotta get back in and find this bitch and Jocelyn's like god damn it and that's how the book ends so one thing I really liked about this is that at one point she talks about how like after she got flayed like she's good with the spanky stuff for a while but she doesn't know when Kushal's dart is gonna strike again and so her getting back in the game is a little bit of like okay me and Jocelyn were like we're vibing we're kind of in the more peaceful state but this is a part of myself i have to go back to but also she's going to be the spy master now and again that's one thing i really liked about this book it's not just that there's like kinky sex in it it is sort of about that and the kind of choices and the experience i finished it yesterday so i haven't really thought this through particularly well and we have no time I, like I, I haven't quite figured out how to frame it correctly but i do really like the way that it actually engages with the mindset and asks questions and the explores the nuances of it. in a really positive light like it presents bdsm in a really positive light in a situ in a world where you don't have to hide the fact that you're in the bdsm community wonderful okay i have to leave i'm so sorry i love this book it's really great please read it guys but i have to go because i i need to leave now i love you bye so uh gina i'm gonna be reading the uh second book at some point are you down to do another one uh yes i actually i really liked how these were written i um Mm -hmm. i really liked how they're written again I, i was telling maria who is now gone that Jacqueline Carey writes the way I wish I could write and she writes the kind of content I could. I just, uh, to the viewers, I kind of wish the book was shorter. 30 hours is a long time. I still feel that the first third could probably be cut down on, but I did like the um, the politicking and the master spy works and that kind of stuff. I, I'd yeah. say the second third could have been cut down. <laughs> Wrong. Uh, anything we didn't bring up in the review that you want to touch on? I can. I mean, I can wax poetic about the symbolism and amazingness of the presentation of BDSM for like the next twenty hours, but I'm not going to. You get the main points here. I will say that if you're looking to for this book for smut, it's not smut. Nope. It really isn't. There's some smut in the first, it, but even then, it's not really smut. It's just people having sex. Surprisingly, even the fan fiction for this book is not a whole lot of smut. Like That's you would very think it would be, but it's not really. So one thing I also had mentioned to Maria is that um, I read a series called The Dresden files which are like um urban fantasy right and they're not horny with the world building but the books are so horny like all of the female characters are super hot there's sexy evil vampires and sexy evil fairies and morally ambiguous sexy fairies and what's fascinating is like you look at a book like that where the world building isn't horny but the narrator is and then you look at one like this which is much more i don't know if i'd say the the world building is horny but it is very sexual and then the actual tone of it isn't and part of that again is the distance she's able to build between the characters and the narrator but also she just isn't super interested in writing detailed sex scenes um which you know i think was really interesting and uh i think the whole disconnect that you're talking about between the narrator and the reader or character and everything like that like i think that alone is a really positive thing for the bdsm community because you get a lot of people who are reading this who are not part of the community and they have little to no exposure to it so like if it was like a true first person perspective of she is like living these scenes even if it's not detailed sex but like she's living these scenes she's going through these emotions she's like experiencing all of this and like you're engaging her emotions a lot of people won't be able to understand what's going on and they're going to learn to not like her or think she's weak or like everything like that when you look at it from like a distance perspective the way that the author writes you really get to see okay like well she says this thing but she acts this way. And like the reasoning behind it is this, like it really allows people who have no experience with BDSM to connect and understand it. I've not seen anything else that allow- that can do that. I think what it is, is that 
you know, in the BDS, I'm not telling you because you know, but for people listening in the BDS, yeah. like, yeah, Gina, let me explain this to you, honey. Um, <laughs> in the BDS on community, you know, there's such a thing as like a scene, right? Which is mm -hmm. like the container within which the power and control and, and pain and all that are within. And then there's outside and outside is like aftercare afterwards. A lot of people, I feel like when they write BDSM content or smut are writing as though the book is the scene. Right. Yeah. So like there could be like uh, I could see like the Scaldi part, for example, could be like it's not seen from a very far distance. It's like, oh, isn't it kind of hot that there's like non-consensual stuff happening? But I think it's valuable that this book doesn't do that, that it is a more realistic case, because especially in 2003, when this was published, again, there was a lot less literacy about it. So people mm -hmm. who are new to BDSM or from the outside could look at it and go, oh, OK, this is what the lifestyle is about. Not here is the fantasy portrayed as real, because then you get into issues of. So like, OK, so like a good example of this is Fifty Shades of Grey is not written from that outside perspective. And it's because it's fantasy, it's not clear to people coming in what is morally okay and what isn't? And what is the, just the author is like, oh, this is fun. I just want to do this. And I right. think that confusion with something that's so not well understood is a problem. And in this case, that it, there isn't that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's really valuable about the book. The other thing though, is that like, it exposes you to both the positive, ambiguous and the negative parts of BDSM. Because, you know, ideally, most of the people like listeners who are in the BDSM community, I hope that you've all had really positive experiences all the time and have never had a situation that went badly. I also know that that's very unlikely. This book addresses that. So there's one scene with uh, Childrick Soames, I think, who goes too far. She, he pushes the scene too far. He actually legitimately injures her. And, you know, that in itself can easily be seen as, well, he's a bad person. He shouldn't have done that, all this other stuff. What you're missing, though, is that a lot of the times when you actually, and it is described in the book, Phaedra didn't say the safe word, which is like, well, Phaedra is like, you know, victim blaming, blaming there. She didn't say the safe word, but at the same time, she genuinely didn't think that it was going to go that far. And it kind of paints it as like, Children of Soames didn't really expect it to go that far either. Like it was just a playful threat. And the good thing that happens though, is the author then shows what you do in that situation. So something happened that shouldn't have happened or is about to happen that shouldn't have happened. He immediately goes into protect Phaedra mode. Like he gets rid of the branding iron. He calls for a doctor. He wraps her up in like blankets. He tries to take care of her. He makes sure that he, she's well taken care of. And, you know, she recovers. She's fine. But having that knowledge at any scene, it could go wrong, even if it's something really simple, like a simple, like, rope bondage session you got to be careful that you know you're not cutting circulation too much like a lot of it's even no matter how much experience you have with any part of bdsm you've got to just like have it an awareness in the back of your mind that you could have to go into quite like triage mode here and that's why i mentioned before that like never to a scene when you're so angry you can't like you just see red like it's not good because if you do go too far or something bad does happen you can't handle it right. <laughs> BSM really is a very special, like both people come from it for different reasons, but it's coming together for a play that is safe. So it's safe, sane, consensual. And having that reaction in the book of like, here's all the good things about it, but here's also the bad things about it, but here's why those bad things aren't necessarily bad. That again is another thing that is really uncommon to see anywhere. And I really appreciate it being here. I think that's very true in terms of, you know, he makes a mistake, but that doesn't make him a bad person. Right. And that is when you're dealing with something where the bounds of consent and pain and uh, power and control are so blurred mm -hmm. that, yeah, sometimes somebody might overstep, but that doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make the activity itself bad or wrong or deviant. It's just like, okay, we need to take. This is how it's dealt with. Sometimes we go too far, but you know, then we give them lots of money afterwards. I think is also what he does. Well, <laughs> but but yes, yeah, but I'm joking about that. Too. I'm joking about that part. Yeah, that's one of me. So yeah, I think again, it's you, you can really tell that Jacqueline Carey knows what she's talking about, mm -hmm. and she wants to explore that, even if it's not the most shouted in your face theme of the book. Um, and so yeah, I, I really enjoyed the book. It's really well written. I think 
I, I have trouble recommending it because it is, I feel like that first third is hard to get through and is so different than the other two. But um, I think also this review kind of gives you an idea of what you're in for. So do you have any uh, last thoughts? Uh, hopefully we did as well with this review as we did with the one that will never be shown that made you want to read it. So hopefully other people will want to read it now. <laughs> okay. All right. We will talk to you all uh, later. Bye. All right. Bye.